Hey everybody, happy Friday. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, uh, you know, take a few minutes and, and go over some stuff uh, uh, here with Amon Gerbach. Um, quick little bit about myself in case you don't know me. Um, I'm a one-man lab operation in uh, the oldest fishing village in America. It's called Gloucester, Massachusetts. If you've ever seen The Perfect Storm, um, that was based right here, right down the road. And uh, uh, I love it here. Um, the ocean is a hop, skip, and a jump down the street. And um, it's fantastic. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great being uh, in this area, especially this time of year. It's just beautiful. Um, so anyway, uh, wanted to go over this case um, that uh, has been um, just a, a joy to present a few, a few different times. Um, it was uh, a, a great collabor uh, collaboration piece, and the reason that I called this the measure of success is is basically because um, you know it's uh, I'm going to show you uh, the the procedure that um, the dentist and I went through to to get this really fine product at at, at the end, and it really was a uh, very um, calculated um, but yet fun case. And so the success part is not only the finished restoration, but it was the journey getting there, um, what we learned <clears throat> as a team. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll get on with it and, and, and show you guys. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank, you know, Amon Gerbach and, and everybody. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few names here, um, but uh, you know, Richard, obviously, obviously Saskia, uh, Christian, Mo, Nancy, the, the whole, you know, Patrick, the whole, uh, the whole team, um, they're just great people. And, you know, when I first opened my laboratory and had the chance to start speaking for, for, for companies, I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't um, just represent someone who was interested in um, uh, giving me that opportunity for monetary value only. Like, um, obviously we're here to, to uh, to make a living and support our families and everything, but really when it comes down to uh, present or to representing a company, um, I'm very very particular uh, about the quality of that company, and not only that, or the quality of the products products that I actually use, but the team of people behind that company that support me in turn. And so I'm really excited to uh, to chat about this case uh, featuring Amon Gerbach products. Here's uh, the view uh, right down the street from my laboratory. I always show this in my lectures. Why? Because I can, <laughs> and it's beautiful. Um, if you look closely in the background, you can see Boston on a clear day. You can see Boston uh, uh, quite clearly. Uh, and this is right around the corner from my lab. So it's, it's a nice place to walk and decompress and obviously take photographs. Okay, so um, one thing that I'm very particular about uh, is sharing uh, the collaboration team, right? The, the people who um, made the case successful. And one thing that bothers me a lot that I see is, is dentists and technicians alike don't give their, uh, their teammates uh, props, you know, uh, mention the dentist, mention the technician. So this case is, a collaboration with Dr. Miles Cohn, a very good friend of mine. He uh, is the owner and operator of Nuance Dental Specialist up in Portland, Maine. Uh, very uh, fantastic um, clinician, and very proud to, to be able to to work with him. We um, this is Sharon. Um, Sharon is the patient for this case. Um, such a cool lady. Uh, you know, whenever I get the chance to meet a patient, I always jump on that opportunity, even if it's driving an hour and a half to Portland, Maine. Um, it's, it's, especially on cases like this, it's just incredibly important. Um, <clears throat> but Sharon had some issues. She had some, some complaints. Obviously one is uh, <clears throat> she had had this tooth extracted a while back um, and, and had some, had some issues. Um, you know, there's an edentulous spot there. 
uh, area there. She wasn't too concerned about that. Um, believe it or not, her, her hygiene was really impeccable. Um, she just, you know, was not blessed with fantastic dentition. So when Miles sent me these photos originally, um, you know, uh, from the get-go, I'm starting to think of what material I'm gonna use. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's different options, metal ceramic, and which is sort of a, a classic material, especially for bridges. Um, but at the same time, uh, Miles and I wanted to uh, really utilize some of the some of the materials that were on the market that were sort of wowing us that we had been seeing. And obviously, you can see here there's a, a very tight occlusion. Um, and you know, I really respect Miles because he didn't want to reduce more dentition than he, he absolutely needed to. And so after studying the case and, and talking it over, we both decided to use the uh, HT plus um, and, and, and go with that. And so, you know, for, right from the get go, I'm starting to think of fabrication designs, framework designs, so on and so forth. Um, and also I'll go back to that with the, the tight bite. Um, I, I wanted to keep the the lingual of the restoration monolithic um but i really wanted plenty of room in the front to to play with my ceramics to get some depth and uh and and some life out of those she's got some very interesting characteristics in her teeth so here are the the preparations um very tall very parallel which is what we want uh, for you know retention and long-term success. And this photo here, <clears throat> um, I don't have the photograph, unfortunately. Um, but after pouring the models and 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 studying this and and trying to figure out what we were going to do, uh, I made a putty matrix of the temporary that that Miles had made. And I I said, you know, I, I really need a little bit more room uh on the incisal of, of number nine there um so i made a reduction coping um and we actually did a framework try-in for this so that's when the uh, reduction was made um it was a very small amount maybe half a millimeter three quarters of a millimeter uh here are the temporaries this is what i made that matrix off of um which you'll see in a minute uh but uh, you know, very nice temporary. She was very happy uh, with those. Um, but uh, funny story, actually, um, Sharon was going to go in for hip replacement uh, surgery. And so um, time was of the essence. You know, we, we all know what that's like. Uh, I'm getting married next week or I've got a funeral in two weeks. <laughs> you know, who, who knows what it is. But um uh, th this this was our time constraint, uh, and the reason is is because she couldn't go in for hip replacement with temporary restorations. They had to be permanent, and then after her surgery, she would have had to have waited. I believe it was like four months or something like that. It was a, a really extensive amount of time before she could go back into the into the dentist office and um, and get something permanent. So um, we had decided. Uh, from the get-go that we were going to uh, make a beeline towards uh, finishing this restoration as quickly as possible. Um, this is when I uh, uh, went up to, to Maine to meet her and take some shade photos. Um, again, something like this, uh, as good as photography can be, um, meeting someone in the flesh and really studying their, their natural dentition and natural sunlight and at different angles, you know, uh, photography is, is very one dimensional, it's very flat. And so there's only so much of that that we can see. Um, took me a while to, to, to figure this shade out. Obviously, I, you know, you work by value and everything, but 3R 1.5 was, was, that was a, a pretty close dead ringer um, for what I wanted. And uh, I always tell people that <clears throat> a shade tab uh, is it doesn't not only does it show you what to uh, what material what what colors to use but it also shows you what uh, what colors not to use what to leave out of the equation or add in 
that makes any sense. Okay, so um, let me go back to that before I start my other story. Um, the one photo that I, I, I don't have for you guys regret, regretfully is the uh, the shade that I took for for that that recession uh, neck of the of the tooth, the recession area. Um, I wanted to show that the final restoration. I wanted it to blend really well, and that turned out to be uh, uh, a very uh, dense, opaque, uh, chromatic, you know, very very saturated color um, that I uh, that I recorded, you know, uh, on paper and, and then on, on the camera as well. But that was, to me, that was the key to uh, getting this restoration to work. I, I, I tend to take shades from from the cervical to the incisal. Um, so, and, and the reason I, I do that is, uh, is because of this gentleman. I, I, I like to give him uh, props whenever I can. His name's uh, Walter Gephard. Um, he's a, sort of a, a hero of mine in the, in the industry. Not only is he a wonderful person, but he's, in my opinion, the, the best technician on the face of the planet. Um, and he taught me uh, I remember I, I, I've been able to go to Zurich and, and stay with him a few different times and sit there and watch him and, and learn from him. And uh, I asked him one time, how does he make his crack lines so beautiful? And he said, don't worry about crack lines. It's not what matters. What matters is the, thir the cervical third area of the restoration and how well that blends in with the, the soft tissue the, the, and, the, and the, the pink tissue. And uh, that really stuck with me. And that, that's what has sort of formed my philosophy um, for myself on on a successful rest restoration, which we'll touch on later. Okay, so um, the model system that I'm using that I, I want to start this case out with is the Giroform system from Amon Um <clears throat> and it it's it was a learning uh, curve because I've you know been doing the Pindex system for close to 20 years. And uh, it was funny, Nancy and, and Mo were, were in the lab, uh, my laboratory last week, it was a, a great visit. And uh, and we all agreed that to learn this system, you kind of have to forget your past model experience and, and let yourself learn fresh and uh, um, like a, a, a new laboratory technician, right? So, um, but once you do, it's uh, I won't go to anything else. It's just fantastic. Um, so this is the the um, I'll give you a brief overview of how to fabricate that model in case um, some of you might not have the system. Um, but uh, you have these impression trays, and then you <clears throat> you trim your impression down so it's it's flat from the from the top. And uh, there's actually this is sitting on a, on a bed of uh, yellow putty that is provided with with the kit to uh, hold it in place. And the important thing with these, uh, especially you can do quadrants as well, but with the full arch is um, I like to make sure that that midline is lined up um, with the tray. And as you can see here, it's not quite lined up. Um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty close, just so it's a little bit more um, uniform and, and neat looking on the articulator when it's done. Okay, so yep, here's the Giroform system. And what I love about this is, is just the, uh, the precision of everything. Um, it's just unlike anything else. It's, it's a fantastic system. Um, so what you do is you, you on the uh, top left-hand corner, you can see you put the putty uh, around, you make a border, and then you fill the palatal area in as well. And then to your right, you can see it's a, like a clear, um, uh, base that you put on top, and that's basically so you can um, you can see where uh, the model, the final model is going to sit when the the, the the pins have been drilled, and um, so that way you can make sure that everything is placed correctly. Um, and then on the bottom left hand corner, that's just the uh, the base plate that's in the uh, in the in the saddle there. And what happens is you you mount that on top of the drill, and that laser. Uh, is showing you exactly where those pins are going to be, uh, or the, the holes are going to be uh, drilled for those pins. Um, and so you're actually drilling the holes from the from the bottom side there. Uh, and the cool, the, the, the reason for that is 
for uh, expansion issues, uh, you know, the precision of the whole thing. You can see the holes are drilled there. Um, and uh, you basically pour up that model after, the, after you place the pins, you turn it over, as you can see on the bottom left, uh, on top of that, that putty. And, um, and then after, after 20 minutes uh, or 20, uh, 25 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, you can pull it apart. And as you can see on the bottom right, that is the amount of stone that I used. Very, very little was wasted. And that's what I love about this as well. You know, I'm a, I'm a one, one person laboratory um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider myself a penny pincher, um, but I don't like wasting uh, things like stone. Um, that bothers me a lot. It's it's very frustrating. And with this system, um, the amount of stone that I save is like astronomical. And I'll show you this slide, uh, a pretty cool slide here uh, coming up next. Um, so basically, after that's that's uh, been poured up. Well, I'll I'll get to that in a second. The next slide. This is just a quick cell phone photo of some work I was doing. Uh, last week, I have uh, five of these, uh, I call them saddles or impression holders. Um, and so I do five models at a time, <clears throat> which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you have a flow going, boy, I mean, you're just, you're just, uh, you know, getting new models started all the time. Um, so obviously you can see three full arches and two uh, quadrants there. And I'll give you a second to think of how much stone I use to pour all of those up. And I guarantee you, you'll, you, well, I don't guarantee you, you may not believe me, um, but I used uh, 150 grams of stone to pour all of that up, which, I mean, growing up, uh, you know, 17 years old when I was learning how to do models, I was always told, you know, uh, 50 grams for each quadrant and 100 grams for each full arch. I mean, that's just how I, I poured everything, is you pour them up, pull them apart and grind them down to a, a uniform shape, right? So this is, you know, 150 grams of stone for for that many models is, is pretty, pretty crazy and fantastic. I just love it. Okay, so after it's it's been uh, uh, pinned, I trim the model down. Obviously, this is a yellow model. This is the original um, model that I made for this case. I, I I'll admit that I did stage those photos in the beginning just so you could see the process. Um, but the other fantastic thing about uh, this system is, um, for, for one, the accuracy for um, in between uh, your, you know, your contacts. Um, I always pour a solid model. Um, it's just out of habit. I, I want that static, untouched model to check my contacts. But nine times out of 10, with the Giroform, the Pindex system, it, my, my restorations drop right on, perfect contacts, everything. Um, it's, that's how precise it is. You don't have dyes wiggling and moving back and forth. There's no glue involved. Um, it's just clean and efficient and, and, and just beyond fantastic. Um, so as you can see here, there's like this other magnetic plate uh, that I've mounted to. And these are just mounting plates. Um, I don't, can't remember the, the Amon Gerbach name for them off the top of my head. But what this does is after that Pindex is, is done and cleaned up and, and, and everything, um, I put that magnetic, magnetic plate on there and that's what I mount it to. And so I, for one, when I'm layering ceramics or, uh, yeah, I mean, layering ceramics, right? You've got a full mouth case or full arch case that you're working on or a long span bridge. The worst thing in the world is when you've got your ceramic on there um, and you put it back on the articulator, you've got this giant, uh, you know, uh, mountain of, of mounted stone, you know, and it's, it's heavy, uh, it's cumbersome, and then it clicks on there real hard and all of your wet ceramic slouches and runs everywhere, it's terrible. So with this, I can just take that plate right off, do my layering, and then carefully and, and precisely put it back on that plate before putting it on the, excuse me, putting it on the articulator, so. Um, that's one of my, one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite features of the, the Giroform system. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, not that case. It's a, another case. Uh, actually it's, it's a, 
it's a show uh, model, but it's just showing how clean and streamlined and, and uh, uh, just elegant everything looks. It's precision and elegance, right? All wrapped into one. This is the Amon Gerbach CR articulator, the black edition, um, which I was very, very um, honored to, to uh, be able to get one of these. And I just love it. In fact, I, I use it. I mean, articulators are meant to be used, but it's, it's a special case. It's a special case that I pull this articulator out. Um, I like to keep it nice and nice and clean. Okay. So for this um, uh, for this uh, framework, like I said, we used um, the HT Plus, um, and I had a uh, a mutual friend of Miles and 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 me, uh, mine. Uh, up in Maine, mill this out for me. Um, but I really wanted it to be uh, to my specifications. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I was just very particular. I spent a long time, you know, I can wax pretty quick, but I spent a long time making sure that this is exactly um, what I what I wanted. And so I had him copy mill it. And you can see the the um, matrix material there on the right uh, that was with the, the temporary uh, model and so now I'm seeing that I've got the, exactly the right amount of room for ceramic um, and the, the monolithic uh, lingual which is actually quite quite thin um, not past any guidelines but it, but it, it was it was uh, uh, it, it just came out beautifully it fit Here's a few pictures of the design from the copy mill uh, or the copy scan, copy mill. And then here is the uh, the framework on the model. Uh, it just fit beautifully, uh, just smoothed out the margins and um, you know, a few minor adjustments, <clears throat> but it, it, uh, it just came out beautiful. As far as the shade that I used for, for the framework, um, so I've, uh, been using uh, GC initial material for for all my ceramic um, work, uh, and <clears throat> uh, there's a conversion chart for uh, 3D Master Vita Master Shade Guides, and basically I treat my zirconia as I would treat opaque for for a metal ceramic or PFM, um, and I didn't have that conversion chart with me at the time that I chose the shade, but I said, you know, do A2. I know that will at least be a, a starting point. Um, and, and my technique for preparing the zirconia always includes adding color anyway. So I knew that an A2 was a very uh, good, happy medium to start with. <clears throat> okay, just a picture of, of the, uh, the putty matrix with the, the, the framework, which, you know, just replicates my, my wax up 99.5 percent which just came out beautifully <clears throat> so I'm not going to show you my layering um, uh, technique or whatever that doesn't really matter that's not why we're here but one thing that I did want to stress was my preparation of zirconia and uh, and it's it's a bit of a lengthy process um, compared to even opaquing metal or or just you know doing a quick wash bake um, but the length or the, the amount of time it takes me to do this this preparation um, pays for itself because I'm not remaking anything. Okay, uh, and that's uh, what I mean by that is is we all know that ceramic and zirconia really don't like each other. We have to we have to force that relationship to happen. And I, you know I I know a lot of technicians that that will just put ceramic on. Uh, on their zirconia um, and it looks beautiful i just i can't do that because i know that that sheer strength isn't there and so um i take these extra steps to to prepare my zirconia and, and i i have to thank uh my friend josh polanski down in, in new jersey he's the one that um really he sent me some articles that he he had helped write in the past and uh um it's been foolproof. Uh, in fact, I, I've had a few restorations fail um, where maybe I've, I haven't done this before. Uh, it's been years, but you know, 
you think you can get away with it just once and, and you want to rush it and get it out the door and you know three months later the patient comes back with the ceramic sheared off anyway to the point um, my 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 preparation for zirconia is is after you finished it in the margins are smooth uh, I give it a light sandblast with with uh, aluminous oxide steam it off really well uh, making sure not to get the zirconia too hot because um, sudden blasts of heat the zirconia doesn't doesn't care for that either um, and what I do is I put the the I call it a naked framework in the uh, in my ceramic oven and I run it up slowly to uh, roughly 1150 degrees Celsius um, with a one minute hold you know no vacuum or anything and then I slow cool it and I'm talking like no faster than 30 degrees per minute especially with a um, when, when there's pontics involved in, involved in connectors um, and what that does is if, if you imagine your 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 framework being milled uh, it's in the green state right you get it out uh, you, you cut it out of the puck and there's dust everywhere there's debris uh, the oil from your hands is is essentially soaking into that zirconia um, and and then we center it and it comes out of the centering oven and it looks beautiful and that's great but um, it has been proven that that there are still contaminants in in that zirconia um, from a number of different factors um, but what those do is those those will help repel the ceramic right it, it's it's not as um purified so by me doing this i'm i'm almost giving giving it a second center if that makes sense so when that comes out of the oven uh i will basically treat it like a metal framework i will use a combination of luster paste uh and the stains and i will um i'll shade the the framework however however i want to you know uh i'll warm it up from the from from the margin uh the cervical third and i will um I do you know go in approximal basically treat it like like metal opaque and then when it's still wet what i do is i'll take some uh, clear fluorescent ceramic and i'll sprinkle that on the framework um and uh and then i'll fire that at uh i think it's I think it's nine, 950 maybe Celsius, again with a slow cool. And so what I've done is I've taken that luster paste or you can use your, that's just my choice, um, but the luster paste is a, a micro ceramic. And then with the, the fluorescent powder on top of that, I've really forced that, um, that cohesion, that, that bond. And then that's when I start uh, uh, layering my ceramic from there. Um, now, in the case of having a monolithic lingual, I don't want to sprinkle ceramic on a monolithic lingual because then I'm going to be polishing uh, sort of the grit of the ceramic off when the when the restoration is done. So what I do is I will um, I'll actually do my entire framework with the luster paste uh, and the sprinkle, but I'll I'll leave the monolithic section um, sort of untouched, and then afterwards I'll I'll sort of wipe it off with a little scroll brush and then and then add luster paste to that and the other thing too is when you're when you've got a monolithic lingual this is essentially your first glaze so when you're done with your ceramics and you're um uh you know you're like oh you know I, i've worked these hours on this texture and and the the contour and the line angles and you've got all your little your little uh you know trademarks um for anatomy um, and then you go to glaze it, but you have to glaze the, the lingual side twice. And then, so all of that hard work goes away. So essentially with this technique, um, I just glaze everything once and then it's done because that monolithic area already has a coat of glaze on it. Sorry, I rambled on about that for a while, but for me, it's very, very important. And, um, and, and I enjoy telling people uh, like yourselves, you know how that has been uh, successful for me it works out really really well my my uh my shade check um on the model um you know and you know i i, I always do this you know you check your shade um and i know that it's on a white model for one 
So the adjacent teeth on the model and the preparations underneath, even though it's zirconia, it's all sort of working together to maybe um, change your perception of the shade a little bit. Um, so I check it with the shade tab, I take a photo, I know that intraorally this could have kind of a different effect, right? Because you've got you've got uh, your pink gingiva, you've got your your natural dentition. Um, but with this check, I'm I'm very happy <clears throat> with the way this looks. Um, I'm not super thrilled with the incisal of this, um, but I was gonna go up there. Uh, I had my oven in hand uh, with me. I went up there for the insertion, which was a lot of fun. And I thought, you know what? I can I can change things real quick. I can uh, you know cut back and and add something in there if I need to. But she was literally, <coughs> excuse me, she was literally going in for her hip or hip replacement. Um, I think it was the next day. So it was like I brought everything with me. <coughs> <coughs> to make sure that this went in. So then uh, to check the value of the shade, I like to, to throw it in black and white. That kind of helps my eyes relax. And instead of seeing the color, I'm seeing the value. And that's really what, what, uh, uh, what's most important. You know, you can get away with, with the color being off, but if your value's off, then, then uh, it's, it's a no-go. Okay. So here's um, just a quick side note. I, um, you know, dental photography. Um, I don't teach dental photography or anything like that, but the the one, uh, the bit of advice that I can uh, give to people is to, um, well, let me back up. The big, uh, the popular thing to do is to have big diffusers on your, on your flashes, um, whether it's paper or, you know, your, your giant, you know, giant umbrellas or, or whatever. And what that does is that really diffuses the light and it can make your restoration look better or worse in the end. Um, so I do uh, a few different things. I, I, uh, I use a twin flash for all of my, my photography. So I, I'll use one with no diffusers on the left. Um, I use a piece of printing paper over, over my flashes for diffusers. It's a lot cheaper than, uh, you know, $150 set of diffusers. <clears throat> uh, and I, in my opinion, it works better. And then the, the the third picture on the right is actually a speed flash, um, you know, that mounts on the top of your camera. And I've got this giant donut diffuser where the lens goes in between and that speed flash goes into the donut. And what that does is it gives a very, um, like a, a, a very diffused ring light effect and it makes everything look like it's, you know, slippery and, and glassy. So yeah, this is just oh, this is also my way of checking, um, you know, checking my my anatomy and my contour and my texture. It just gives me a different different perspective. Um, let me go back a picture here. As you can see, if you look in, <clears throat> in approximately between eight and nine, you'll almost see like a little a little uh, connection there. And that's the other great thing about taking photos of your work is you see anything in the macro um, that you might not see even under a microscope because you're, you're so concentrated on, on one particular spot. Um, but I like to take a photo, throw it up on the screen, and I say, oh, what, what is that little, it almost looks like if there was saliva, there's saliva connecting the, the inter, you know, interproximal there. And while it was just a little piece of glaze that uh, uh, it got in between there, I didn't, I didn't wipe it uh, uh, before firing. And so I had this little connection of glaze there. And so I was able to, even after polishing, I was able to go in with a real thin uh, diamond disc and just break that connection and smooth it off a little bit. Okay. So here's some nice uh, mirror photos for the ooh and ah um, effect. Looks good on the big screen. So the day of uh, insertion, um, Sharon came in, uh, uh, and, uh, it, it was cool. We, we got the, <laughs> I remember Miles temporary was, was, uh, so intimate fitting. It, it, it took a, it took a few minutes to get, get that off, but, uh, the, those, those parallel margins. And, uh, when we tried the bridge in, it was, it was almost, almost had that, uh, that suction effect. I mean, the, the fit was so. Uh, or like a hydraulic effect. You put it on, it almost 
pulled the it pulled the restoration on. And um, you know, we tried it in, uh, and then I mean, it was I was very very fortunate. There was no adjustments. The contacts were perfect. The occlusion was perfect. Um, we were all very very satisfied with the shade, so we decided to go and and uh, and cement it in. And so here's a picture of the, you know, cool picture of the, the cement oozing out there, um, and the blanch and the tissue, which it's blanched, but you can still see the stippling. And and from what I've learned, that's exactly what you want. You, you want that um, that little bit of blanch, and and it that came right. You know, the the blood returned just a few seconds later, um, and so it really looks like that pontic is growing out of the tissue, which is which is what we wanted. Here's the final restoration. Um, what excites me so much about this case is not only is it <clears throat> not straight, white, and perfect, uh, it's got a little twist to it. Obviously, you know, 10 is flared out a little bit. I tucked seven in, um, and, and those are the cases that I just get a, a kick out of doing. Um, but what, what made me really happy about this final restoration is that cervical third area that Walter Gephardt uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, that 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 the importance of that. I haven't had lunch, so my brain's starting to tell me it's hungry. Uh, so anyway, I was able to get that cervical third just beautifully, and and that's that's the highlight for me in this case is those. Uh, <clears throat> Those exposed roots are all are all matching beautifully. The little bit of stain around there is just uh, matching beautifully, and and she's got a real high smile. And so you know afterwards, you know we were hanging out, just kind of decompressing a little bit. And every time she smiled, I wasn't noticing the little inconsistencies in the in the incisal edge. I was noticing that 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 cervical third area was so spot on, and it just that's all that mattered. You know, it, I've got a quick video to show. Um, that uh, Angelo Rombley, uh, Miles Cohn, and myself made um, with Amon Gerbach's help. It came out really well, so I will play that now. I think it's important to draw inspiration from nature, whether it's um, a landscape or something in the macro, like foliage or, or um, a rock or a walk in the woods. Making teeth, there is a, a very, I would say, a very specific balance between art and nature. And so it's finding harmony between those two, uh, those two ideas that will lend a very helping hand to making a, uh, a life-like restoration. I was about to make a major life decision about my teeth. My mouth really looked a mess. It was a mess. And he, um, he really studies your mouth and he tries to work what, with what is there, not to try and make you into something you're not. When I was in his chair, I started to actually listen to his languaging around everything he did and instead of saying look away or it, it was like always look towards it was always everything was in the positive so the very first time that i met sharon and did my intro oral examination the first thing that really stood out to me was the natural inherent beauty of her teeth and it's interesting because i think many people would look at these and think that they would need to restore these. And in fact, the dentist that she went to prior to coming to me had suggested that they do a full mouth rehabilitation on her and she really didn't want that. When Lucas and I began treatment planning Sharon's case, one of the very first considerations that we had to think about was what was gonna be the material of choice for uh, the framework for this bridge. We knew that we wanted to be ultra minimal. Uh, we knew that we wanted it to be extremely aesthetic and extremely strong. 
So independently and almost simultaneously, Lucas and I both suggested that we use Zolid HT+. They still have their natural diversity, you know, like each one is a different shape because they always were like this. And this one's a little in front of this one. And it's like they're my teeth versus somebody else's teeth. <laughs> it's like my smile is that. One of my favorite quotes to end this uh, is be yourself, everyone is taken. Uh, by one of my favorite authors, Oscar Wilde, a uh, fantastic uh, writer from Victorian England. But I think, um, you know, everybody has their own individual teeth. And so I think one of the, I'm just going to throw in my little philosophical blurb here. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy in dentistry to sort of um, uh, push button or stick with your style. Um, it's very easy to lose the connection uh, to the fact that we're making these for, for someone. Uh, they're going in someone's someone's body, and whether it's a single central full mouth restoration or a, um, uh, whatever, a single molar, um, I think it's very, very important to uh, approach every case uh, differently and with, a, with, with fresh eyes, as, as hard as that can be to do sometimes. But um, yeah, your own, your own thumbprint on your work, whether you're just the model guy or whether you're whoever, uh, I think is, is very important. So the end. <laughs> thank you very much. And thanks to Amundur.